Hello and welcome to the Majlis, ready for your Radio Liberty's current affairs podcast focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, the host of the Majlis podcast and ready for your Radio Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. You might recall last week on the Majlis podcast, we discussed how Turkmenistan and Tajikistan have been handling, rather mishandling the pandemic with uh, potentially a bad consequences. With Tajikistan confirming its first case last week and the COVID-19 patients are rapidly rising since and Turkmenistan rep- remaining in denial about the pandemic. We thought this week uh, we should look at some of the relaxation and reopening efforts that are taking place in the rest of Central Asia, namely Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, in Kazakhstan. So while number of cases on the rise in some of these countries, how to make sense of this confidence? What's their case for reopening and how are they planning to manage the transition or how they are managing this transition? To discuss all these, I'm joined by from Almaty, Kazakhstan, Joanna Lilis, a British journalist, author of many articles on COVID-19. From Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, Dr. Nur Sultan Masalbekov, who is an ophthalmologist working in local diagnostic clinic. I like his new uh, initiative, which is called Hi Doctor. Uh, Alisher Sadiq is uh, with us from Prague, who is the director of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Uzbekistan service, locally known as Ozotlik, and Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us today. So let's start with you, Alisher. Uh, today, the the Uzbek service, your service, has been reporting about the beginning of the gradual opening of the country. Tell us, please, what are they opening exactly? Yeah, it's not the opening of the country. You know, the borders are still locked up. You know, flights are still on hold. The opening is, is like easing inside the country a little bit. Hmm. So they divided the whole country into three sectors, yellow, green hmm. and red. So it's depending on the number of cases or fresh cases. So in the green zones, Hmm. there are two zones uh, in Tashkent primarily. You're allowed to drive your car. So uh, markets and shops are started, opened. In uh, other zones, you have more stricter and tougher measures as they still kind of... uh, trying to prevent the further spread of the virus. So that's specifically Fergana Valley, very densely populated Hmm. areas in Fergana Valley, like Andijan, Namangan. So there are red primarily. Food markets are open, Hmm. but the rest is partially uh, operating. Hmm. Joanna, how about Kazakhstan? They started the opening on May 4th, I guess. So what has been happening since then? What what has changed? Yes, I mean, we have, in a way, a similar situation um, to Uzbekistan in that we've got a slight easing of, of lockdown, mainly starting from um, this week for, on Monday. And what that means is the opening of more small shops and businesses in, in the cities that were very strictly locked down before, let's say, Nur Sultan and Almaty particularly. Um, and that means that... That, um, you know, there are a lot more people going to work and also that um, there, there's a little bit of effort to kickstart the economy, if you like, by getting small businesses to work. I mean, this includes things like hairdressers, which, are, you know, so, some people are, are flocking to them to get their hair cut after seven weeks under a very strict kind of lockdown. But other people are obviously nervous of, of the um, implications of that, of that, whether it's safe or not. And um, we've also in Nur Sultan and uh, Almaty been allowed um, to go out to have a bit of exercise. Now, that was banned before um, under what as I say, it has been quite a strict form of lockdown. So from this week, we've been allowed to go out and have some sort of exercise. In fact, that was permitted in in, in Nur Sultan from last week. And also in Nur Sultan and uh, Almaty from last week, uh, people were permitted to take their children out for either a bit of mm. exercise or to use a playground because children have been, a bit, you know, had been told to stay at home, not that they necessarily were all the time. So that's what we've got. And I mean, what mm. we're seeing, I think, is um, we're seeing that the government hopes, presumably, it's got this public health situation under control even though the uh, cases are still rising. I mean, there's a lot we don't understand about the figures, about the testing and about the curve. But um, we're we're seeing attempts to kickstart the economy. And Mm. uh, but what I would say, finally, just briefly, is that, you know, people clearly don't understand the new rules. And I've been out on on the streets today just to shop uh, near my home. And, um, you know, people are just out in groups, although there's a ban on more than three people gathering. People are wandering around gathering in groups. Mm. People are uh, playing basketball, which they've been specifically told Mm. not to do because it's a group sport and um, nice. generally there seems to be a very 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 serious lack of awareness of the two meter social distancing mm. rule yeah you know in, in Kyrgyzstan Dr. Nur Sultan uh, what the authorities have been doing there in terms of reopening the country the situation in Kyrgyzstan is a similar as at Uzbekistan and also at Kazakhstan 
our government says that so our country will be opened on May 11, but Ministry of Health worries that after the quarantine weakening, the situation could get bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but wait, the uh, number of cases could be rising. So these questions are still uh, under the question. So we don't have still uh, the answers okay. so, uh, until, until these days. But in our capital city, in Bishkek, people are walking. So uh, most economical places are working. I mean, uh, shops are open, so they are started working. You are saying that shops are now open in Kyrgyzstan. People are walking outside in Bishkek. Compared to the situation in Kazakhstan or maybe in Uzbekistan, where all the public transports were banned, and Joanna was saying that even walking outside was not allowed at some point. Now you are saying that in Bishkek, people are doing these kind of activities, although that relaxation process has not even yet started, as, as you say, which will start on May 11th. So how much yes. of a lockdown was there in Bishkek to begin with? Uh, so lockdown was started approximately one month ago. Hmm. Uh, the duration of the lockdown, firstly, it was two weeks. After two weeks, they set another two weeks until 11th of May. But at this moment, at this time in capital of the city, we have got some quarantine weak- weakenings. Hmm. So the lockdown is still working, but we have got some quarantine weakenings in that case that we don't have so m- many cases uh, of COVID-19. This moment we've got approximately 600 COVID positive cases. Yeah. Uh, the most cases, approximately 600 cases are treated and the patients are not in the hospitals. Yeah. So at this moment at hospitals we've got approximately uh, two or three hundred patients. Yeah, so, I, have, uh, I, have, I have so many questions about those numbers. Maybe we will get back to it a little bit later. Bruce, uh, let me bring okay. you in here. Uh, while some of these countries are opening up in this the other way, could 19 patients are on the rise, right? Certainly, Kyrgyzstan was never never rising like so rapidly. I mean, strangely, even though Kazakhstan seems to have been the one that kind of put the, a genuine lockdown on fast as anybody, they're the, probably the ones that have their, the greatest increase in cases. Uzbekistan, all of a sudden, for a while they did, and, and they were given figures that look kind of credible. But then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks ago, it was pretty obvious that they, they, there was less cases reported. It was, you know, Ali Shear would know more about that than me, but, but it was kind of suspicious that they seemed to fit the general pattern around the world world for a while and then they dropped off. I mean, they had almost as many cases as Kazakhstan a Mm. month ago. And Uzbekistan has got not twice as many people, but not far from that. And of course, a a lot more migrant laborers who returned from Russia where, you know, it was spreading already. And um, but for some reason, they don't seem to log as many as much of an increase as you would think would be normal. Do you, Uh, you, Bruce, before you go to other countries, should we get Alisher's point on why this might be the case? Yeah, absolutely. Alicia? Yeah, the main issue throughout this uh, pandemic in Uzbekistan was the number of channels you getting information from. Mm. So in Uzbekistan, is the only one channel, official channel, mm. that streamlines all information. There's no way to verify, challenge, or provide alternative information. So that's why... I mean, we are basically doomed and uh, to to follow what authorities are offering, yeah. and all these uh, strange fluctuations. Of course, officials they always have explanation for those things. For mm-hmm. example, when the number started, you know, immediately stopped growing, the uh, explanation was mm-hmm. our measures became effective, uh, went, went to effect. So, so that's where we are. You know, basically, it's very difficult to challenge that. Yeah. Bruce, do you want to continue? I mean, also, when we say like this many patients are in this country, and we also need to keep in mind that how many testings are taking place there and how we can rely on, I don't know whether the authorities are giving any data in terms of the testing patients. Is, have you seen anything like that? No, you know, I mean, that was, I was just going to po- point out that we don't know how, how energetic, aggressive the testing is. It doesn't seem to be very much. Mm-hmm. And uh, certainly in Uzbekistan and, and Kyrgyzstan. And there's another thing that we don't know. You know, a lot of rural communities, this is true in Kazakhstan also, but a lot of rural communities are not near medical facilities, even if they're geographically very close, 50 or 60 kilometers. The roads and things like that are so bad that you have to wonder how many people are out in the countryside uh, that have these cases and they just, for whatever reason, can't move them to a hospital, a local medical facility, or there's not enough room in the local medical facility. So, you know, obviously the cases are higher than they uh, are reported. I mean, there's a lot of questions, like I said, about 
testing. If mm-hmm. they if they was testing program like South Korea or Germany or somebody like that was really went out and tried to test as many people as possible, yeah, the cases would would surely be far higher than mm-hmm. they are at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joanna, is there anything you would like to add from Kazakhstan? And Kazakhstan has, was one of the countries who started reporting about these cases initially from Central Asia and how they are doing with the testing. Are their testing process is transparent? Can we rely on their numbers? Well, um, I mean, I, I think there are just too many questions about this. Now, um, I would say that Kazakhstan's been certainly better than Uzbekistan in releasing um, information about uh, what's going on and what, what kind of um, systems it's following. And also the numbers certainly look more transparent than Uzbekistan, plus the fact that in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan also, they release information on numbers of medics infected, which we don't have from Uzbekistan. But um, when it comes to testing, we just don't have full information. We get um, some piecemeal numbers um, now and then, uh, this many tests have been done, but we don't really understand what the policy is, whether only risk groups are being tested. We were told that um, recent some quite sharp rise in cases in Almaty, last week I think it was, uh, was down to an expansion in testing, but we don't know um, at that time figures were given but we what we don't know is what's the policy what's uh, how many tests have been conducted nationwide mm. and who is being targeted and what is the target um, in terms of numbers obviously i mean i think uh, not only in these central asian countries uh, but in any, in any country in the world in, in in various countries in the world there is this problem that we we don't really know how accurate the figures are because we don't know how many people are, are necessarily being tested whether people are being reached you know so i guess this is a real um, issue with kazakhstan and with the other countries, I'd say. Right, right. And also, uh, uh, Bruce, just to get this out of our way, that today we are n- not talking about Turkmenistan and Tajikistan because Tajikistan is not only locking down the country, but it is not able to cope with the disaster which was in the making while the country has been denying that even it exists. Now, God knows what is happening in Turkmenistan, which not only denies that it has quit, but keeps organizing these massive events in the country. Maybe we should give a quick update from these two countries on where they stand as the rest of the region is kind of thinking of opening the country. Well, you know, I mean, Tajikistan last Wednesday or something, uh, the 29th, they finally said that they had 15 cases and now they got almost 400 and they don't release figures every day. So, you know, there was mass spread of, of cases of what they called pneumonia for weeks that they, they said were, was nothing more than simple pneumonia um, that was killing off people. And, and now clearly they yeah, everything's catching up with them. It's going to be, they'll be lucky uh, if this isn't a disaster for them, you know, within a, the next month or two. And Turkmenistan, like I say, is still the same as far as they're concerned. They don't got it. It was interesting that their first day invited the World Health Organization to send a delegation or at least said they would they would accept a, a delegation from the WHO. And But then all of a sudden, they have been reluctant to give a formal invitation for this delegation, which has already made it to Tajikistan to come. You know, that's probably not so much because they're, they haven't finished hiding all the evidence of COVID-19 in mm. their country, but rather that quarantine camps were in an area that suffered huge damage from uh, hurricane winds and then torrential rains. Yeah. So they don't want to bring anybody out there. Not so much, like I said, not so much because they haven't cleaned up everything and they can point to these camps and say, see, there's nobody here with the, with coronavirus, uh, but because they would have to take them on roads that would go by, mm. you know, destroyed houses and flooded fields. Right. Speaking of hurricanes, uh, Alisher, Uzbekistan is going through some hurricanes in Bukhara. And earlier, there was a, a huge uh, dam break in parts of Uzbekistan, uh, which perhaps changed the headline of the news in, in Uzbekistan. So how that is affecting Uzbekistan's efforts to reopen the country? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It was almost a perfect storm, you know. You have a COVID situation that uh, authorities were, like, struggling to deal with. And then on the top of it, uh, you know, strong winds that uh, demolished thousands of houses, uh, left thousands of families without electricity in Bukhara. And then when we thought everything is over, we had a dam burst in Sirdaria province. Again, uh, evacuation of tens of thousands of people and then destruction and, you know, all attention went into that rather than, you know, focusing on COVID. And easing of the situation is partially described that, you know, the country needs some relaxation during this period as they were trying to collect charity, organize people, so, you know, relocate people. So that was, you know, on the top of, uh, of everything. 
And, you know, COVID was primarily sidelined in Uzbekistan by these events. Right. Let me bring you, Dr. Nur Sultan, you here. I mean, you you are in the front lines of fighting this disease in, in your country. While the region is kind of clearly divided in two camps here in terms of uh, their dealings of pandemic, yeah, on one hand, like Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, they are uh, in Turkmenistan, it's not really clear what what they are doing, but in Tajikistan, they are not able even cope with the situation these days. And the other three countries, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, are kind of thinking of relaxing the restrictions there. So what comes to my mind is there are two different camps, but are there any discussions taking place between these countries on how to coordinate their efforts? As a doctor, are you talking to your colleagues in Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan how to manage this? Is there any commission jointly uh, created between in these countries who are trying to coordinate their efforts. Have you heard anything like that? Actually, uh, our Ministry of Health is uh, coordinating uh, their steps with uh, WHO, a World Health Organization, and they are uh, making uh, their strategy according to the recommendation of uh, World of Health. So I'm certain that also Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are to listening the WHO's uh, recommendation and making uh, their own strategy. Plan, what uh, about by... what about between the neighbors, like between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan? Are they talking to each other on how to cope uh, with the situation? Actually, uh, we have got closed borders. So on official line, we don't have the coordination plan. But if we take the doctors, I'm cooperating with my uh, colleagues uh, from uh, United Kingdom, from uh, Kazakhstan. And, and they are saying that actually they have the same problems as a Kyrgyzstan. Uh, in their country. So, so uh, that, that's kind of taking place on the individual levels. Yeah. Speaking on a government level, Giovanna, have you mm-hmm. heard anything in terms of the collaboration, coordination of these efforts uh, between these, these countries in the region? No, I haven't heard anything like that. I've only heard, uh, you know, presidents exchanging phone calls and so on, but no. What stops them from coming together, teaming up against this this pandemic? I mean, it, as it's clear that it, it's a regional issue that they have to deal with this together if they want to open up the country. I think um, I think what stops them is what stops uh, many countries in the world doing this. I mean, we've seen certain dislocations in, in the in the European Union as well, haven't we? Um, I think it's just a fortress mentality. Each country retreats into itself and uses national methods to deal with it, um, national national tools and, and uh, national solutions, pro- probably because uh, partly because they enter some kind of crisis mentality and liaising internationally is, is difficult. But I, I'm, I, I, and I also think that when it comes to opening up again, as, as mentioned, or all the three countries we're talking about here have, have not meant, give, given any sign of when they're going to open up their borders. But when, that, when it comes to it, it won't be a question of just regional cooperation, but it's all about global cooperation too, and, and what countries citizens will be allowed to visit and on what terms and so on. So I just think um, that it's not unique to Central Asia that there hasn't been a great deal of liaison over this um, in terms of solutions and mechanisms. I also want that Bruce, your thought on that. And of course, there are challenges like in, in European Union, it's a big, a big discussion. I believe you guys know more than me uh, sitting in there. So they have lots of questions about how much the coordination is there between the European Union countries. But when we speak about Central Asia in the same terms, your thoughts on the, the need for the coordination, again, and it kind of leads me to question the entire logic of this reopening process. Uh, are they really getting this right? Well, you know, I, again, they've never, not since they've been independent, have, have the countries really shown great cooperation, practically any field you can think of. You know, that said, you know, under the auspices of the World Health Organization, they have some coordination that they've gotten together. I mean, they've they've sent people to not all the countries, but, but the three that we're dealing with today, and certainly Kazakhstan, has sent um, specialists and, and doctors to different areas, actually, in the world, to trainings and to different areas and they're, they're supposed to have a mechanism to cooperate amongst each other the, you know the world health organization has been trying to get them to have some body that would oversee that you know um unfortunately not everyone is is so willing turkmenistan of course being the obvious one that i think they've they've only sent people to these joint training sessions once in kazakhstan or something like five or six years ago oh. so th- there is a blueprint for it but there's not much history to show that that even when it was 
just voluntary and, and simple drills that they were overly enthusiastic about participating in it. And now when they really need it, it's probably not a surprise mm-hmm. that, that they're uh, having a hard time getting together on these kind of things. I'm sure there's uh, there's more discussions between the politicians than the medical staff, as, as far as I can see. You know, as the opening or reopening of some sort continues, a mismanagement of this transition is a recipe for going back to lockdown. And the possibility of this is very real. This is what the Secretary General of the World Health Organization has been saying yesterday. So if they have to reopen, it's crucial that they do it right. They manage it right. Maybe original response is too much to ask in terms of Central Asia, but how about the way these countries are managing this process individually? And what are the areas to keep an eye to determine where they are succeeding and failing? Let's continue the debate talking about these and many other questions very shortly. First, let me recap the Majlis podcast that today I'm joined by from Almaty, Kazakhstan, Joanna Lelis, British journalist, author of many articles on COVID-19, from Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, Dr. Nur Sultan Masalbekov, an ophthalmologist working in a local diagnostic clinic, Ali Sher Sadiq, the director of RFRL's Uzbek service, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free Europe, the Liberties and Religia Blog, Kishlok Awazi. I'm Mohamed Tahir, Radio Free Europe, the Liberties media manager and host of the Majlis podcast here in Washington, D.C., and we are discussing a by some Central Asian countries to relax their lockdown in the context of COVID-19 outbreak. Welcome back, colleagues. So, Doctor, let me get back to you. So, looking into this reopening process in your country, in your neighboring countries, the way it has been handled, as a doctor, what keeps you awake at night? I guess we have some worries. So, after the reopening, Hmm. the positive tested COVID will rise exponentially. It's a, it's a big worry, but in, on the other side, we have got some economical questions. Mm. People are this moment were on a self-isolation, I mean, uh, on a quarantine, on a lockdown. They uh, was approximately one month. They don't have enough money to buy foods, making some kind of these stuffs. So the second side of the lockdown is economical stuff. Yeah, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Nursultan, let the economic side uh, to the authorities to deal with. But as a doctor, do you think mm-hmm. your country is ready to reopen? I think, I think locally, I mean, uh, not whole country, locally, some towns, some cities are ready for reopen, but they must use distancing. They have to use some uh, self-protecting things. I mean, masks, hand gloves, and etc. So in this case, our country, I guess, locally is ready for reopening, but not whole country. Also borders. Mm. Uh, Alishir, what what's your thought about Uzbekistan? Is the country ready for that? You know, depends whom you ask from, you know, Mm. if you ask uh, working people who have daily earnings, you know, very much dependent on their on their small businesses. Yes, sure. They would say we are ready to go. And uh, why not? I mean, you know, we better have some virus than starve to death here. So that's the opinion of of many people in in Uzbekistan. Mm. But again, if you ask experts, they believe it it should be done in a very uh, cautious cautious manner mm. and there let's not forget there are a big uh, group of people who are benefiting from this type of uh, situation you know mm. those who who has monopolistic rights to sell you know specific products like foodstuffs mm. you know that they also became very powerful you know during this crisis you know right. so imagine you have the exclusive right to sell flour what well, this is what what they actually have now you know so mm. certain companies are giving these rights you know for them yeah that situation longer it continues is better mm. so it depends whom you ask whom you from ask. in the community. yeah so at the end authorities have to take this decision i mean what what the authorities are saying why it's the right time to, to reopen the country. Authorities are basically, President Mirziyoyev mentioned the economic uh, situation in the country hmm. and, and uh, also mentioned that the measures they were in place and, you know, Uzbekistan had very draconical measures and it, that includes, you know, complete shutdown of districts and uh, even the control over people's going out of their own houses, driving is banned and then uh, elderly people are completely banned from leaving 
Like if you're 60 year old, you cannot leave your house. It's banned. Yeah. So, you know, the whole country went into halt. And so authorities believe that also have to listen all all the groups, you know, all the interested people and then mm. make their own decision how to, to move on. Right, right. Joanna, Kazakhstan has started the process like a couple of days ago. There are a couple of things that I have in mind uh, to ask you here. So what is your initial observations about how far they have come and how the outcome has been so far? And the second thing is, so since the number of cases are on the rise in the countries. I think it stands like 4,500 today, COVID positive patients. So what I'm saying is, I guess, what is the measure that the authorities use as a case for reopening? Well, I think um, the case that they're making for reopening is that although um, the situation is far from solved, they believe it's relatively stable. Now, if you look at the curve, it, it certainly doesn't appear to be look, rising that sharply compared to, to other countries, although I, although I don't think we can say it's flattened. So I think I think they're weighing, like every other country that's trying to emerge from lockdown, they're weighing up the public health situation with the economic impact and with the frustrations among some of the population. I mean, as, as Ali Sher just said, no one wants to starve to death and they're you know although the government is giving um, handouts to people who've lost their earnings they can't go on doing that indefinitely it's cost them almost a billion dollars so far so I think um, you know there, there are these two considerations as everywhere and it's complicated um, and I think they're also aware that people were getting very claustrophobic and frustrated as everywhere where people have been under strict lockdowns mm. but I think um, you know there are there are obviously arguments for reopening more of the economy and allowing people a bit more freedom to move around but what I would identify as the main problem is the messaging. The government doesn't appear to have sent clear messaging about what the easing of lockdown means, although they have repeated over and over that this does not mean that easing it does not mean it's over, nor does it mean that the danger from coronavirus is is over. Um, This is not the message that people are hearing. So it must be about Mm. how they are delivering the message and how often they're delivering the message and how strongly they're delivering the messages about this. And as I said before, I mean, I, I think one of the things that could present a real, real danger to Kazakhstan that is totally Utterly, utterly preventable is um, that the government has not managed to communicate to people the message that two meters of social distancing offers great protection. And um, oh, you know, the, the, on the streets, people have clearly not under, understood that. In shops, they have not understood that. Um, rules about how many people are allowed in shops are not being enforced either. And um, neither are rules about um, wearing yeah. masks in shops. So yeah. I think there are some very simple measures, but chief among them is the fact that the government simply needs to somehow affect communicate this message, not simply about social distancing and physical distancing, not simply by um, getting an official to stand up and say it on the news, but by using social media more imaginatively mm. and, um, you know, having big signs on the streets or in shops or something like that. I think this is the danger for yeah. Kazakhstan going forward. Maybe maybe part of the problem is the messaging, Bruce, here. So while these three countries are kicking off the reopening process, even in the best case scenario, what are the reopened country would look like? How do people imagine a reopened country there. Do they understand it? I mean, uh, who does exactly? Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're doing what is at the moment the common wisdom of, you know, at least their, their idea is we'll start letting some businesses open and we'll start letting people gather in greater numbers. You know, like in the Czech Republic, for instance, there was, I think, what was it, like four or something at the start. It couldn't be more than four. And now we've gotten up to 10. You know, so there's little things like that, just a little bit, easing it a little bit at a time and then trying to see if all of a sudden you've, you've eased it t- too much and, and and you're starting to get more cases reported again. You know, that said, you, you're, what you were talking about a minute ago about, you know, what what should they ease up on to begin with? You know, I mean, no one wants to starve now because they're not getting the salary, but no one wants to starve in the fall and the winter this year, too, because crops didn't get planted. You know, things didn't get produced that, that are going to be needed in a few months. Uh, you know, so it's it's a balancing act that all the governments, you know, in the world, really, but, but certainly in Central Asia have to consider all the time. There's going to be a lot of people with hands up for donations and financial assistance and all kinds of humanitarian aid this year. And none of the countries want to be too dependent upon that. You know, like I said, when when this year comes toward an end, and if you haven't got your, your crops in, if you haven't been producing food items, then you're going to face famine on top of possibly facing a second wave of this at the same time. See, you know, it's, it's, it's a tightrope act, and you got to let people get out and work. We've already heard, you know, some people only get paid if they show up. Yeah. Uh, so a lot 
knock themselves down means to go broke and to starve. And mm -hmm. everyone knows they'll starve to death, but people aren't sure that you know maybe there'll be some of the people that don't get the the coronavirus. So you know, on a, on an individual level, that's kind of the the way you have to weigh the process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, there is a strong case to push for uh, reopening, but also there has to be a balancing act between the economic interest and the health consequences. We also need to be winding up the discussion here very soon. So before that, uh, just a couple of points. So it looks like that they are going to go with this in terms of the reopening of some sort, at least in these three three countries. While they are thinking about this, is there anything that they are not paying attention to get it right, Alishir? Alishir, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. I'm just thinking yeah. thinking about yeah. your question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult one. So if, if there's anything they're not considering... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's really difficult one. I, I mean, I... Uh, you know the measures that are the, the, some measures are really strange. For example, hmm. yeah, and uh, that that for example this uh, driving ban on driving. You know, why would that be there at all? I mean, why would driving would be banned? So no one could respond to this. You know, I haven't heard about such measures anywhere. Yeah. And now when they are introducing easing on driving. Again, it's a it's a it's a scheduled type of uh, easing. You know, in the morning they allow two hours of driving, and in the evening like three hours or something, and that creates even more chaos. More, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, in bazaars, mm -hmm. more people are gathering, and more cars at the same time on road. So these type of things, uh, you know, a lot of what we see like measures that are really not uh, effective or or not explained well that causing people you know yeah. to to uh, to think why would that be what who needs that type of measures yeah. at all yeah yeah dr nur sultan what's your point of view as a doctor i mean as they are reopening the country as you said in kyrgyzstan it will start on may 11th what is your observation is there anything that the authorities are not paying attention while they are focusing on reopening actually i don't even know because there are a lot of measures i mean a lot of sites uh that you should think about. So the main thing uh, that uh, comes to my mind is that our authorities doesn't have any strategic plan, you know, and there is no any kind of transparency uh, of their, uh, in that case, uh, that they are giving us an information. So the main thing that authorities are making some is they don't have the strategic plan right. they don't giving uh, us the information about uh, what kind of weakness are we are going to do i mean uh, step by step first yeah. of all secondly this kind of things will be opened yeah. and the third step will be the opening of our of whole country uh. i mean in this case after the reopening the uh, cases of covid could be the risk of rising is uh, very very, very, high. very so. high. You know, I have to win the discussion here, really. Um, so we are way out of time already. Joanna, let me take your final notes here. Uh, considering that the reopening process will continue, where your eyes will be to determine or where our eyes should be to, to determine the failure or success of this process? Well, just briefly, I mean, obviously on, on Kazakhstan or on, on any country, that uh, it'll be about um, where the number of cases goes, what happens to the curve, does it flatten or not? And of course, as we've, we've already discussed, we have so many problems anyway with whether we have full information to judge that and how many cases are in, in society without being detected. Um, and obviously, um, you know, we're going to have to see how the country manages to, to kickstart the economy and get it back onto any kind of footing where people can, can actually start earning. Um, you know, Kazakhstan's expecting its first negative growth, in other words, for the economy to shrink this year for the first time since 1998. So it's going to be really tough. And it's also going to be about how effectively the government manages its um, massive spending package. It's got a 14 billion dollar anti-crisis package um, for the for both for health um, measures um, extra doctor salaries but mostly for economic stimulus and it's going to be about how effectively that is managed because we've mm. seen past crises in Kazakhstan where economic um, stimulus packages have been massive um, but um, have been ineffectively managed so um, you know we, we need to President Tokayev is going to have to keep a very big um, handle on all of this as Kazakhstan faces probably its worst crisis since the 90s mm. you know uh, Alisher in Kazakhstan's case of course they have money to 
to spend, but uh, it's not a luxury that every country has. So talking about Uzbekistan, where your eyes will be, how they are managing this, and what are the areas they are succeeding and what are the areas they are failing, where we should look to determine that. Yeah, of course, uh, we're looking into economy. I mean, this number one thing where we look at, it's it's going to be a really difficult year for Uzbekistan. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, it was a perfect storm in Uzbekistan. All of a sudden, before everything happened, they started talking about poverty, about elimination of poverty. That that became an open topic in Uzbekistan, which is, which is great. But they also adopted some measures to fight poverty. And then everything started. And now that discussion about fighting poverty is is no longer around. Uzbekistan's borrowing, international borrowing, tripled already. It's uh, If you can compare with Karimov's time, it's it's incomparable. I mean, incomparable. But now it's $28 billion will be by the end of this year. So a lot of money is spent for, for this crisis and how they will use these funds and uh, whether they will be able to kickstart the economy me and uh, that's a big issue okay uh, Bruce uh, your kind of general observation of these three countries where where your eyes will be going forward to determine whether they are succeeding in managing this process or failing in this be looking to see if there's any reports of um, the cost looking at the price of food how much food is available and also looking to see if you know their figures for how many cases they have and are they accompanied by rumors as we've heard from someone so often in the last few weeks that you know there are way more patients than the government is saying and that reasons people are dying uh, are not the true reasons and they're actually from this virus i mean if those stories go away uh, and i like I, I haven't really heard them from kazakhstan for instance but i do hear them from uzbekistan tajikistan and, and turkmenistan you know where they say there's some people dying but they're not they're saying it's something else it's not right. the virus so i'd like to think that we'll get to the point where the figures match you know everyone's satisfied with the figures and you don't hear stories about them trying to doctor the books to make it look like they have this mm-hmm. under control all right thank you bruce so with this we really have to con- concluded debate here for this week. We will, I think, get back to this next week, focusing on some other aspects of COVID-19. Um, speaking of other uh, aspects, you know, a lot has been discussed on this, uh, or every show has been about COVID-19 in Central Asia since the pandemic has started. Is there any aspect, Dr. Nur Sultan, that is missing from headlines that we are missing as a journalist? No, actually, uh, I guess uh, the journalists are giving very... Uh, good and transparent information about the COVID-19. Also in our country, our journals are doing their best. Uh, they are searching the information. They are giving for us the uh, facts about the COVID. So uh, in this case, journalists are doing the great job. I don't even know what kind of uh, cases they are missing. Mm. My opinion is they are uh, working very good. Good to hear that from a doctor. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nur Sultan Masalbekov. Uh, and also thank you very much for your service. Um, oh, getting into the studio, I also wanted to give you a shout out about your initiative, uh, which is called Hi Doctor. Uh, maybe in two paragraphs, uh, you can tell us what is this project about? Oh, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, the healthcare system uh, in our country is not good so far. The quality of the service, I mean, the medical service is going down uh, from year to year. Mm. So uh, with my friends, I mean, uh, we uh, initiated the company, uh, which will work only on uh, rising up the quality of healthcare system. And at these days, we are building the system. Mm. Uh, which will uh, help doctors to make easier the process of treatment. I mean, by using uh, artificial intellects, by mm. using deep learning technology, mm. and et cetera, et cetera, we are trying to build some kind of new type of local healthcare. Wow. Uh, right. So well, that's it. Well, thank you. Thank you, brother. There couldn't be a better positive note in the discussion here. And thank you. Big thanks also goes to mm-hmm. Joanna Lillis, a British journalist in Almaty, who is also the author of a book called Dark Shadows Inside the Secret World of Kazakhstan. Uh, Alishir Sadiq, the director of Ready Free or Freedom Liberties Uzbek Service, Ozotlik. Bruce Panier, the editor of Ready Free or Freedom Liberties Central Asia, Blog Kishlok Awazi. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, Ready Free or Freedom Liberties media manager and host of the Majlis podcast here in Washington, D.C. We will be back next week. Until then, keep washing your hands, keep them away from your faces, and of course, stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye bye.